Good to see some people are awake and some not. Okay. No, they both do the same thing. If you do lose something, do not hop off the train or try and hop off the train to retrieve the item yourself because as I'm backing up, I may run over you and I can assure you we don't carry any spare body parts on the train. <laughs> Opposite us, you'll see what is now operating as the sweet shop. But when it was in official operating, it was the smallest operating post office in South Australia and catered for the eight and a half, sorry, five and a half to 8,000 people who lived on the mine site. In front of you, you'll see what is now operating as our museum. But when it was built in 1878, it was built as a school to cater for 800 students. But in its heyday, it had 1,100 students enrolled. As we go around the track, you'll see quite a few ruins. And the reason for so many ruins is that when the mine closed in 1923, the, uh, the shareholders wanted as much money out of the mine as they could possibly get. And that resulted in all the machinery being, be, being sold as scrap metal. And as the machinery was made in the 1800s, it was extremely large and cumbersome. Therefore, they found it much easier to knock down the buildings rather than get the machinery out of the buildings. If you look to your right on the corrugated iron wall, you'll see a sign up there which says Wheel Manta. Up there, there are two languages. The first word wheel is Cornish for workplace, in this instance a mine, and the second word Manta comes from the local Aboriginal people, the Naranga people, who call this area Manta Montera, meaning thick impenetrable scrub which is what covered the entire York Peninsula prior to white settlement. Finally up here we have a visitor's book which we encourage people to sign, make an entry if they've enjoyed the trip, found it informative, educational, etc. All you have to do is put your name, suburb or state down and your remarks. I ask one extra thing of all lady passengers on board, but if you are taking a time to make an entry in the book, just add how handsome and intelligent the driver is, please. <laughs> okay, I hope you all enjoy the trip. And uh, uh, we'll be making some stops. I left a bit out. Along the way, we'll be making short stops just to change the points so we don't end up going round and round in circles. We'll be making two longer stops. The first stop, everybody remains on the train and listens to uh, rec the recording of the sociology of the area from 1860 when the mine opened and when it closed in 1923 and also how the mine set up. At the second stop at what we call the wash and dry, we actually drive through the wash and dry building and stop at a purposely built platform where everybody hops off the train and walks back into the uh, wash and dry building we will relate to you the process that was used to recover copper out of the tailing heaps, plus a couple of local stories. Okay, I hope you enjoy the trip.
Germans first discovered at a place they were called Wallaroo Mines in 1859. The smelting of the to process the ore and export. Ore was later taken from the Munter Mines to Wallaroo by a bullet train, which was a very slow process, taking two days each way. The whole area of Wallaroo, Kadena and Munter was leased by Walter Watson Hughes, a retired Scottish sea captain. He came out to Australia in 1840 and ran sheep in this area. Captain Hughes had asked all his shepherds to watch out for any signs of cotton, which was indicated by greenish coloured rocks or green flames in their campfires, and offered a reward of six pounds a week as an incentive. discovered signs of copper just near him, supposedly in rocks near a wombat boat. Paddy and some others decided that they would like to have a copper mine of their own, so they went off to Adelaide to register their mine. Unfortunately, they had not drawn a very good map and were a bit vague on details, so their claim was rejected. Back they came to Moonton to have another go. Paddy's trip took a while, Meanwhile, Captain Hughes had been told about Paddy's discovery. When Paddy got back to Newton, Captain Hughes had a word with him and made him an offer of a tenth share of the mine if he would tell him where the copper was. Paddy accepted this because he still intended to claim the mine himself anyway. And so Paddy's group set off to Adelaide again. However, Captain Hughes very quickly got the area surveyed made out a good set of documents and sent his fastest horse rider, William Paul, down to Adelaide to try to beat Paddy to the registry office. Now we will stop just up here and then I'll tell you what happened next. So, we left William Paul racing up to Adelaide to beat Paddy. Well, Mr. Horn managed to get to Adelaide in 17 hours. That may sound like a long time to us today, but remember that at the time, it could take people several days to get to Adelaide. Mind you, William Horn exhausted eight horses to cover the 100 miles. William got to Adelaide early in the morning and went to Captain Hughes' agent, gave him the documents, and told him to get to the registry office straight away. And then, William went for a good long sleep. When the agent got to the office, Paddy's group was already there. However, the registry clerk was a bit late. When he arrived, he served Captain Hughes' agent first. When it was Paddy's turn, he was told, Sorry, you're too late. This area has already been registered to Captain Hughes. Well, as you can imagine, Paddy and his friends were not happy, so various court proceedings were threatened. However, the matter was finally settled out of court. Captain Hughes kept the mine, and Paddy got his one-tenth share and six pounds a week. Unfortunately, poor old Paddy, who was a bit fond of his grog, died in 1862 at the Leasingham Hotel at Leasingham, over towards Clare, apparently of alcohol poisoning, before he collected any of his reward. However, his wife inherited the six pounds a week and did very well out of it, buying a house and farm at Seven Hill near Clare, which is still there today. The Tipperer Mining Company was formed, and you can see this first shaft in front of you, Ryan's shaft, named after Paddy, of course. This was a huge success, and in the first 20 months, they took out 8,000 tonnes of ore at an average of 25% copper. To put that in context, 
These days, mining companies are very happy if they can get 1% of copper out of their ore. For instance, the yield at Roxby Downs is less than 1%. Ryan's shaft made a profit of £64,000, about $19 million in today's money, in that first 20 months. And the future of the mine took off from there. Due to Walter Watson Hughes' concern about lack of education in the state, he used some of his vast wealth to donate to the founding of the University of Adelaide. The mines developed quickly drawing in miners from all over the state, especially from Borough, where the mines were reducing output at that time. Eventually, the mine had more than 70 major shafts, and the total length of the workings underneath is now about 135 kilometres. However, there were not enough miners to keep up with the expansion, so the company sent back to Cornwall and said, send us more miners. This resulted in a major influx of Cornish miners and their families, which in turn led to this area being famous for its Cornish heritage. At its peak, the mine employed 2,500 men and boys and operated continuously for 62 years. Its total output was 170,000 tonnes of copper and made a profit of £11 million in the currency of the day. It was closed in 1923 due to the falling price of copper after World War I. Move on. Be quiet. Before we do move on, just a little bit to explain how tough the miners had it in those days. Got to get away from the feedback. For the first 25 years that the mine was in operation, there was no mechanical means to get for the, for the, uh, to get the miners down to their place of work and up again. So what they did was build ladders into the sides of the shafts. Take Ryan's shaft over there, 60 metres deep. A miner would walk to work, climb down 60 metres of ladders, do his eight hours work, before having to climb up that 60 metres of ladders and then walking home and having his dinner. A bit tougher in those days than today. This thing's going to kill me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's the microphone making that noise, not me. <laughs> Be wary. <laughs> Across the road in front of us, you can see a big heap of dirt. There is another one over to the right in the distance. These are called tails or skin heaps and contain the waste from the early stages of the concentration process. In all of these dumps and the slime pits, there was an estimated 25,000 tonnes of coal. They wanted to extract it, but didn't know how to do it. After asking around mining communities throughout the world, they found a Spanish engineer called Antonio Delgado at the Rio Tinto mine in Spain, who had developed a method to do this.
inside, you can see the precipitation tanks, which are lined with timber and filled with rusty old scrap metal. These were an essential part of the process. I'll tell you more about that a bit later. Coming up on the left hand side, you'll see the other tool and sample stores work. Over the tool which runs from this area of the mine, the mine came in the bed here. Miners from all over the mine would bring in samples of ore to be tested for quality and depending on the quality for the raw the supervisors of the mine to pay more production schedules. Who, who are game enough, well, I'm not going to... <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't record it. Yeah, yeah she's going to talk about... This is nice, Bruce. Bruce, I'll just let the lady get past. Oh, you're right. I was going to let you go through. Thank you. <laughs> Consider the engineering feat that was achieved in setting up this process 
remembering it was 125 years ago and they didn't have any of the machinery that we've got available to us today. This building was built in 1899 and it was built out of the rocks we covered when they dug the shafts of the mine. And what Delgado did was build a pump station just south of the Moonta Bay jetty. And from Ricketts Point, he pumped salt water up to a holding reservoir in Victoria Park, which is just opposite the Anglican Church in Blanche Terrace. From there, the water gravity fed down to another reservoir that we're going to pass in a couple of minutes. At that reservoir, they built another pump station. And at that pump station, they added sulfuric acid to the mix. They then pumped it up to the top of the tailing heaps where they had a series of canals, channels and levee banks to control the flow of the liquor, as it was then called, down through the heaps. The sulfuric acid reacted with the copper sulphides and turned it into copper sulphate. And when the copper sulphate entered the precipitation tanks that we just passed, they added scrap iron and that caused a chemical reaction which caused the copper to fall out of solution and settle at the bottom of those tanks as sludge. Once they had a sufficient amount of sludge at the bottom of those tanks, they emptied out the water, which went down below, uh, down the back here, down to the settling tanks, where all the sediment settled out, and uh, the water then gravity fed back to the pump station, where it was re-acidified re and then recycled. The sludge was then shoveled up into buckets and the buckets I'll point out to you on the return trip and brought up here. The buckets emptied the sludge onto the platform. The sludge was then washed down with salt water to get rid of any impurities. They then used the furnace which was placed where the hole in the wall is and the hot plate in front of it to dry out the sludge. Once it was dried, it was then bagged up and taken to Wallaroo to be further processed at the smelter. In 1903 and every year thereafter, right up until the mine closed in 1923, they recovered around the 1,000 tonnes a year mark at 90 to 95 per cent pure copper and made a profit in this section of the mine alone of between 3 and 4 million pounds which is between 22 and $28 million in today's money. Between 1929 and 1943, the Moonta Copper Recovery Company was formed to try and emulate the same process. However, they ran into problems may, uh, with, uh, mainly due to the uh, availability of raw materials and also the fluctuating price of raw materials but mainly hindered by the fact that the smelter at Wallaroo had closed and they had to send their end product to either Tasmania or Newcastle to be further processed. In the 1980s, they did an aerial geophysical survey of the area and they found copper close to the surface on the Moonta to Wallaroo Road out here. In the 1990s, they opened two open-cut mines the Wheel Use Mine and the Pina Mines. Out of those mines, they got 40,000 tonnes of copper. Those mines went down to a depth of 250 metres. But as the water table was only 50 metres below the surface, the cost of continually pumping out the water just became too prohibitive and they closed. Just to show you how profitable this mine was, me. In 1876, which if you remember is only 14 years after the mine opened, the company was the first company in Australia to pay its shareholders £1 million in dividends. As I said, it shows you how rich the, the mine was and what it did to help the South Australian economy at the time. Remember, South Australia had only been a state for some 30 years. As we went around on the trip, we heard that they recovered 170,000 tonnes of copper out of this mine. They also recovered one and a half tonnes of gold, 
which at today's prices would value it at around $300 million. That brings us to a legal aspect, as this is a, a, her sorry, a heritage listed area under the auspices of the National Trust. Any gold that you find today has to be handed to the driver. <laughs> They'll take care of all legal responsibilities for you and ensure it's spent in the most pleasurable and leisurable manner possible. In other words, that's bullshit. <laughs> what they did with the gold was used it to supplement, uh, sorry, help supplement the cash flow of the mine, which in turn helped pay some of the miners' wages. The miners' wages over the period of the mine averaged out to be about one pound eighteen shillings a week, somewhere between three hundred and twenty and three hundred and sixty dollars a week in today's money. You may consider that to be a pittance to be working for especially for the uh, type of work they had to do. But when you take into consideration the cost of living in those days being way down there, today it's been way, way up here and getting even higher, at the time it was actually considered to be an above average wage. None of the miners become millionaires on it. However, the only ones that suffered were those that had the cork out of the bottle for too long each day. Now, as most of you are not from Muta, Muta is noted for quite a few firsts. Three premiers were born in Muta, two South Australian and one Western Australian. One of our famous uh, people born here was Sir Richard... I've forgotten his name. <laughs> <laughs> I said it. Was... Yes, Sir Richard, who was the founder of the, the uh, Royal Australian Air Force. Bloody name, anyway. Uh, <laughs> that's what Alzheimer's does to you. Uh, anyway, he founded the Royal Australian Air Force, and two years ago, on the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Royal Australian Air Force, Muta was presented with a fantastic flyover of everything from the earliest Tiger Moth right up to the latest uh, military aircraft. Sir Richard Wilcox. You can see a statue of Sir Richard sitting on his park bench and pointing to his planes in the sky in uh, Queen's Garden, which is George Street, uh, the main street of Newton. Now, as you came up to the train today, you saw the yellow caravan, at, which was our pasty cart. And on top, you saw the ripple, which was supposed to represent the top of a Cornish pasty because everybody thinks that's what a Cornish pasty looks like. Well, we've all been hoodwinked for all of our life, because that's not a Cornish pasty, never has been a Cornish pasty. That's a Welsh-style pasty. Now, a traditional Cornish pasty has its crimping around the edge. And a traditional Cornish miner's pasty has an extra wide crimping around the edge, and also it's meant to be virtually inedible. The reason for that is... That is where they, they're tool to hold, hold their, uh, their meal. And in the mining of copper, there's plenty of dust given off in any mining, but in the mining of copper, arsenic could be present. So none of the miners wanted to poison themselves while they ate their lunch. Hence, the crimping around the edge was made to be virtually inedible. But more importantly, the crimping was broken into three different sections. At one end, it told the miner which end of the pasty was his lunch, in other words, his meat and veg. At the other end, it told him where his sweets were, apple pie, apricot pie, or whatever the sweet was for the day. But more importantly was the crimping in the middle, and that was the individual, individual signature, if you like, of the housewife who made the pasty. So that every miner, when he was down in the mine, even with limited... Uh, light could tell which pasty was his and which wasn't. If the housewife was cooking for more than one person down the mine, like sons or brother-in-laws, she'd add a letter to the top of the pasty, W for William, C for Charlie, D for Dave, etc. Now, a lot of people think uh, the singing of Christmas carols is a uh, European uh, tradition, but in actual fact, goes back before that to the Cornish. The Cornish had been mining for over 400 years. And one of their traditions was 
the day before Christmas, they'd sing their carols down in the mine. And as down in the mine, of course, they have uh, candlelight. The only years they didn't do that was when uh, Christmas Eve was on a Sunday because they had to be in church instead. But anyway, in 1865, uh, the local gazette here recorded that whilst the congregation were singing their uh, carols outside of their newly completed church, which you'll see at the end of this trip, that the surrounding area was lit by the candles on the miners' helmets. And that's the first recording of carols by candlelight in Australia. Now, over here you'll see what people may can take to be a bar. Where in actual fact it was a bar. On a day like today, the miner that would have to have that bath at the end of the day would probably look forward to it. But just think about him in the middle of winter, where the cold water would have a sliver of ice over the top. But no matter, he still had to have that bath. And he was the person that was putting the sulfuric acid into the salt water. Otherwise, he'd go home and spread uh, sulfuric acid, not only smell putrid, but... Uh, take the sulfuric acid hard. Now, you've had a look at our locomotive. The uh, chassis of our locomotive came from the Adelaide Zoo 42 years ago. And if you have a look in the back-hand corner, you'll see a locomotive. That photo was taken in 1901 of the steam loco that ran around here at the time. And as you can see, why we've made our local uh, Loco look the way it does and hopefully it looks pretty well similar to that one that's about all I've got if you have any questions don't be afraid to ask if I haven't got the questions for you I'll ask this young fellow over here <laughs> to google it for me because these side through the fence you can see the concrete tank where the seawater was stored and the sulfuric acid was added. The diluted acid then ran underground to the pump station which is in front of it and fed the pumps which pumped the liquid to the top of the tanks. On the right hand side you can see the remains of the precipitation canals. Unfortunately the timber lining has been removed from our set areas and all that remains is the walkway and the scrap steel that is scattered throughout the scrub. Now out on your right, you can see one of the slime beds. There are some 30 hectares of these out there, and they consist of the fines left over from the final stage of the concentration process. The reason that they are called slime beds is that they contain a lot of fine clay, which makes them very slippery and slimy when wet. side of the bin, you can see what were known as the settling tanks. Water from the precipitation pond ran down to here, with the mud and other materials settled out. Then the water gravitated taken back to the pump station we saw earlier, where it was reacidified and reused in the process. some of the six shafts on Paul's Low. Low was the name used to describe a continuous body of underground ore. Paul's Low stretches to behind the railway station, where it comes close to Alice's Low, which partly runs under the Minter Area School. In 1994, at the end of a sports day, there was heavy rain. Imagine their surprise when they found a large hole in the sports ground. Alice's load had collapsed. We still get occasional collapses and subsidence throughout the mine area. In 1862, 
A broad gauge horse-drawn railway system was built from Kadena to Wallaroo, and by 1866, this had been extended to include meter mines to Wallaroo. The horse teams were changed halfway between Muta and Wallaroo, and fresh horses completed the journey. This horse-drawn system was extended into Muta Township in 1868 and down to the Muta Jet in 1879. It continued to operate from East Muta to the Jetty until 1931, when it ceased operations. The only original horse train left, built in 1896, is on display at our Wheel Hunter platform, where we will get off the train. As time progressed, the horse trams were withdrawn from all transport in favour of steam locomotives, which operated on a narrow gauge railway from Munter to Wallaroo from 1891 onwards. The original railway station was constructed in the township in 1891, and this was superseded in 1909 by the beautiful current building you see ahead of you. The narrow gauge line was upgraded to a broad gauge line operating from Munter to Adelaide from 1927 onwards. It was used to cut grain, general cargo and passengers. The broad gauge railway system, which is the line you can see in front of the railway station, operated until 1979, after which time the railway station was converted to the Visitor Information Centre. If you need any information about tourism or accommodation, wish to view the photographic displays, or want to buy any souvenirs, you can visit the Visitor Information Centre and the volunteers there will be only too happy to help you. The cottages that you see located adjacent to the Kadena Road were for railway employees who maintained the broad gauge railway. Slow and rough guys, slugs and snails overnight.
Soon after this, the town storekeepers were complaining of the cost of cutting woods out to the people living on the mining leases. The problem was solved with the building of metal roads and the development of the horse tram system. By 1870, the shops in Muta were staying open until 10 p.m. on a Saturday evening and many people came into town to do their shopping. By 1873, the town had 80 business premises, five hotels and three banks. It was the largest South Australian town outside of Adelaide and the population of the district had risen to more than 10,000, of whom 6,000 lived on the mining leases, not in the town. One thing we know about the Cornish is that they were very religious. By 1899, there were 16 Methodist churches in the Munta and Munta Mines area. With the exception of the Methodist Church and the Salvation Army, all other denominations were barred from setting up on the mining lease. Even the Salvation Army was looked on with disapproval by some. Of the many Methodist churches that were in use by 1900, there are only three left today that are still functioning as churches. We will see one of these towards the end of the trip. In the early 1870s, Captain Hanger, the most famous of the mine managers, decreed that all employees of the company must attend church at least once on Sundays. If you didn't attend and did not have a reasonable excuse, you could be sacked. The Wesleyan Sunday School catered for 1,100 students and a roster of 330 teachers. In 1866, it was reported that 300 children took part in the Sunday School anniversary celebration, which was attended by nearly 1,200 people. The Baptist Chapel was opened in 1866, but the religion failed to survive. The building stood empty for many years, and in 1891, it was purchased by the state government and became the Muta School of Mines. This was the first specialist school outside of metropolitan Adelaide and was the forerunner of the modern tape system of today. The building still stands in Muta and is now the National Trust Resource Centre. You can see on the left-hand side where the wings used to take the sludge from the precipitation tents up to the washing ground. They were also used at the brushing plant to take the farms left over from the brushing up to the top of the tailings. The As we go around the mine area, you'll notice that all the chimneys are round. The reason for this is, out of the pages of victories, believe it or not, the Cornish were very superstitious, and they thought that if you had a square or rectangular chimney, evil would be hiding in one of the corners.
which eventually gave rise to the tag Moot, Australia's Indian Corn. Living on the mining place, the miners did not have to pay for their land, nor were they required to pay any rates or taxes. There were no building regulations either, so they could build any structure they wanted. Unfortunately, there were also no health or sanitary regulations, which eventually led to widespread sickness and disease and major epidemics in the 1870s and 1880s. Needless to say, the houses were of a low standard. Some were brick or stone, some were corrugated iron, some of timber, or or patch, but a common building material was mud. These were constructed between walls, or as mud and mallet, that is, mallee stick, plastered with mud and paint. When completed, the cottage was surrounded by a fence of tea tree stakes in an effort to keep out the marauding goats. The houses were of a low stand, and living conditions were extremely poor, brought about by the lack of water. To overcome this problem, underground water tanks were constructed, where water from roofs and roads was collected. Unfortunately, these became blue. Disease broke out, and people, particularly children, died in their hundreds. During two epidemics, in 1873 and 1883, over 600 children died of cholera and measles. If you have time to visit the Muta Cemetery, where some 10,000 people are buried, you will see the tragic sight of 600 children's graves just inside the gate against the southern wall. The company erected a stick and sold convenience coffee for two items a day. Head 
on the right is the Newton Mine School, which was opened in 1878 to educate 800 students. All children aged 7 to 13 years were required to attend school. At its peak, 1,100 children were enrolled at the school, the largest in South Australia outside of Adelaide, but it closed in 1968 with less than 30 students. The school is now a museum, containing many artefacts and items of interest from Munter's past and is well worth a visit. Over to the left, in the distance, you can see Richmond's... Across the road from the school, you can see the remains of the township of Munter Mines, which is also worth a visit. There are many ruins of past buildings and a few of the original houses still stand. On the right, you'll see the old reservoir, which was built in 1869 to 1870 to help supplement the water supply to the community and to provide water to the mine's workers. It had a capacity of around 5.5 million litres of water and had a roof over the top to prevent evaporation on hot days. side across the road, you can see the ruins of one of the explosives magazines, originally constructed to house black powder or gunpowder, which was the explosive of the day, and a very dangerous one it was. One spark, that was the end of you all. You can also see one of the interpretive signs in front of you. There are three walking trails with about 45 of these signs around them. Further along on the left was the recreation ground, an area where sporting events took place, including athletics and football. There was a rotunda in the middle where public gatherings could be held and a small grandstand on this side. More importantly, if you look through the trees, you can see a tall building which is Richmond's Engine House, one of the two remaining engine houses on the mine site. This one contained a steam engine which operated the crushing and screening plant and the pumps for Stucky Shard, which is located nearby. The largest steam engine on the mine site was located at Hughes Engine House. It was a single cylinder steam engine with a 60 inch diameter piston and a 10 foot stroke. It stroke five times a minute for 60 years, pumping water out of the mine. Up ahead, after finding the track, if you look ahead and to your left, you'll see the refurbished Hughes engine house and chimney. The ancient driver in the commentary that by then they were obscured by trees. As we come up to the corner of the hill, you can see some of the ruins of some of the important buildings associated with the mine. First on the left, you can just see the ruins of the mine manager's house, where Captain Hancock lived in a two-story house overlooking the mine. Then across the road, you can see the ruins of the mine office. Behind the mine office were the mine stables, which accommodated 100 horses, and across from the stables were the engineering workshops, the largest engineering workshops in the southern hemisphere. But most importantly, if you look to your left and back a bit, down the bitumen road, you'll see the ruins of Hughes Engine House and Hughes Chimney in the distance. Finally, on the left and down the road, you can see the Munter Mines Church. It was built in 1865 and later a mezzanine floor was added to increase the seating capacity to 1,250 people. This in part was due to an edict from Captain Hancock that all employees were required to attend church at least once on a Sunday. In the 1880s, a pipe organ was installed, paid for in part by a handsome donation from Captain Hancock. Services continue to be held in the church every Sunday. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of the trip on the Moonta Mo you got to walk from here. <laughs> Okay.
Whilst I stopped at Ryan Shaft, I mentioned that there was no mechanical means to get the miners down to their place of work and up again. So how did they get the ore up? Well, what they used with these horse whims. All it is, as you can see, is a big A-frame, a cylinder at the top and a crossbar below the cylinder, and a big circle at the bottom. At the crossbar at the bottom, at each end, would lead a set of range to some Clydesdales that used to walk around the bottom here. The cables go across the mine and then down into the shaft. At the end of the cables would be what we call a big basket. I've forgotten the technical name. And the basket would be at different levels down at the mine. As soon as it was full, the signal would be given and the person in charge of the horses would lead the horses in an anti-clockwise direction around the circle at the bottom, which in turn would raise the basket. As soon as the basket was on top of the surface, it would be taken away from the uh, mine shaft opening and unloaded. Once it was unloaded, it would be placed back over the shaft opening, by which time the horses had been turned around and the person in charge of the horses would leave them, lead them in a clockwise direction, which in turn would lower the basket. And that's how they got the ore to the surface. Pretty simple. I hope you all enjoyed the trip on the Mountain Mines Railway. Don't forget to visit his book if you so desire. But most importantly, be aware and stay alert when driving away from you to travel safely. Thank you. This has been a awesome trip. So big thumbs up on this one guys. Big thumbs up. Let's get this video out there. Um, let's promote these guys. Get out there and promote them. And um, yeah. I reckon it's now it's the end of the trip. I'm going to take a photo of this awesome train that we've uh, travelled on, and we'll shall catch you later. Ciao for now, guys. Ooh, ooh. Hmm.